Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. With great pleasure, I welcome back Michael Tazarian to the channel. And today, Michael, can you talk to us about the philosophy of belief or faith? Yeah, thank you. That's a big one, isn't it? And thanks for being inviting me back, uh, Esoteric. Well, this encapsulates a lot. So again, apologies for straying into philosophy at all, but, but this is so crucial to history. What we're gonna talk about actually happened and uh, has the most extraordinary effect on people who have rely on bel belief and faith. So this is gonna be very crucial for those people who may be still caught in that, that have a difficulty shifting. And this is a, by no means to say that then, you know, reason and science and intellect is in some way superior. What we're gonna talk about now our historical anecdotes that change the zeitgeist for both that, but I think they'll have greater impact for those who have relied on faith and belief. But you see, the, there's some other little satellite points that also come up with this. And one is that normally a religious person today, a person who's, you know, really a believer or whatever, maybe from Mexico or from, you know, Africa and some of the third world countries, and they're just adamant, but you get it in Ireland as well. Uh, this this fervent you know this is my life the belief and the faith and they will tell you that their biggest uh, opposer their greatest nemesis is science and they'll say materialistic science you know th those materialists they're the ones that oppose me but they're wrong because at the end of what we're going to talk about today you'll soon see that no science is not in fact as they think a genuine rebuttal of religion meaning that religious people don't really have science as some sort of, you know, opposition in the way that's been presented. There's been a lot of chicanery here. Uh, of course, you do have these debates where you apparently have a scientist, a materialist, atheist, and then you have a bishop or a religious, you know, but I've been saying from the beginning that that's just chicanery of the first order. It's all about insider smiles. So there's that to bear in mind, you know, when you, people are listening to this, uh, realize that no, no, the real critiques of religion and the real critiques of science, they come more from psychology, they come more from philosophy, they don't actually come from science, not as has been presented. Uh, so don't look to the scientists as really somebody who's going to ultimately do discredit the religion. I know that sounds odd, but you know, I'll try to prove it today. Uh, as we go through this. Um, you know, but, but, but even one can see there's a bit of truth to what I've just said, because science and religion are still side by side. Why, why can we go back to the 17th and 18th century, where these enormous conflicts began between these two worldviews, and yet actually here we are in the 21st century and they're side by side, you even get big debates on TV and there they are again, with their insider smiles, I mean, so that already should tell you something's wrong, one side hasn't capitulated or fell away because of the arguments of the other. So that's a little bit odd, wouldn't you say, after hundreds and hundreds of years of debate and books been written by all sorts of people, both pro and con. Well, the fact is, no, no, they're not, they haven't gone away. The fight is not over because they need each other. And we're going to, you know, we're going to explore where this collusion came about. Uh, it's actually one of the most interesting things one could hear if they give it the time. And it's also very, very important for the movement of history, the opening of the modern age. So what we're really talking about, uh, it's not Nietzsche, <laughs> a lot of names, you know, Pascal or Voltaire or whatever. No, it, it, there's a different opening of what we call the modern age. And it's a really fascinating study, actually. But again, especially for those who may be caught in belief and uh, faith without really delving into what those things are. Now, it has to do with a man, a philosopher, a German philosopher called Immanuel Kant. And he was, you could say, 18th century because he was born in uh, 1724. And he's a monumental figure. <clears throat> he was followed just before he died. Another school uh, opened up in Germany called German Idealists. There's really three, you know, major German idealists, a couple of other of their friends thrown in. And this whole school, a very famous school, got established because of Immanuel Kant. They, they weren't all chuffed about some of his ideas. They kind of objected to a lot of his ideas, his proofs of God. Because ultimately, although the man had so much to say about so many subjects, what we're going to talk about does, in fact, come up, has to do with, you know, uh, the metaphysical proofs of God, actually, uh, in, in Immanuel Kant. And they're crucial. They're crucial, you know, for the, for the history of uh, Christianity. He 
just a little bit of background, he, he was a philosopher who mostly critiqued metaphysics. That's what his encyclopedia and a definition will be, that he, he created what was called a Copernican revolution, a second one, because of course the first one was Copernicus, where you know the planets went around the sun, not the sun around the static earth. So the first Copernican revolution was a scientific one, uh, strictly scientific, um, and showed that the planets, the earth included, moved around the sun. They used the term Copernican revolution for Immanuel Kant's philosophy in the sense that he made the individual thinker the center of metaphysics. So instead of wondering about God and his realm and angels and all sorts of other uh, themes and interests, you know, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, St. Anselm, going back to the uh, Don Scotus, all of these great scholastic theorists and writers, voluminous, and this includes Origen and, and Tertullian, all of them going back to the Neoplatonists, he was refuting all of this. He was bringing something to bear that would uh, be like a Copernican revolution. Where, and it sounds simple when you say it, but yet it was monumental. Who is the I who asks religious questions? Who, what, what do I know about my mind and the way I gain knowledge about the world, about psychology, and about God, about the metaphysics? Who is the questioner? So that was the Copernican revolution, and it was dynamic. And... Uh, it didn't just happen sort of on a desert. You know, he was a bit of a hermit, this Kant, but there was other reasons why this question needed to be asked. If it wasn't him, it would probably would have been somebody else. Now, all philosophers, of course, answer previous philosophers, and then they themselves get answered. Like I said, German idealism came after to answer Kant, to critique him. But Kant was also a man who... Uh, uh, was was very, very uh, absorbed in answering previous thinkers. One can think of uh, Pascal, certainly, but Hume, very much uh, uh, David Hume, uh, philosopher from the 17th century, the 1600s, Descartes, similarly, you know, those three, but others as well. Uh, he was, in fact, he really respected Hume, this Scottish uh, sort of British philosopher who's a bit of a genius because He's very important too. It's you know sad that we can't actually go into Hume's thought because it's absolutely relevant to today. He is the first thinker that devastated the foundations of uh, oh you know the foundational principles of science, and they've never been refuted today. If anything, they've even been more corroborated. It has to do with causality and cause and effect and things like that. But back to the point: since medieval days, this is Kant's thinking. Since medieval days. All through the Dark Age, all through this period, Christianity had not been doing well. You know, people have been, you know, people had been backsliding. People had been putting their faith in science. This is the period coming up to the Enlightenment, to the Age of Reason. Well, how did that even replace the medieval world? Is because of just what I've said. The zeitgeist had completely changed, and and young men and thinkers all over the world, from Russia to Americas were okay they may have had to stay culturally christian well remember in those days you had to you had no choice in the matter uh, so so but behind that fail christianity had been losing ground it wasn't captivating the mind anymore and the volumes and volumes of these christian scholastic thinkers really hadn't answered anything all their different arguments the argument for de design the argument for this and that and the other uh, uh you know, really weren't that convincing ultimately to, to laymen as things became more secular, you know, these Christian. And many people saw their work as kind of moribund and very, very abstract. It wasn't stuff that the laymen in the streets, you know, in those days could really understand. So in short, one could say a lot. In short, it was just a change in the zeitgeist where people seemed to lean towards uh, science because there hadn't been in Christianity any really earth-shaking major discoveries where science was like something on jet skis. It was just like literally one discovery after another. You know, Newton, Leibniz, you know, I mean, the list goes on. Oh, think of all the scientists. And they are making significant uh, discoveries in personal health uh, all the way back, you know, uh, all sorts of discoveries in botany, even astronomy. You have your Keplers, you have your Galileos, you have your the Copernicuses and hundreds of other mathematicians. Are, so basically in the race, science had moved so far ahead by Kant's time that a major set of questions now arose. Why is that? 
because they're not working together. Science is opposed to religion. And re so it seems to be criticizing religion. It's, it's showing some of the weaknesses and errors in religion. Oh, oh what are we going to do with that? As I said, Immanuel Kant had many, many insights about a lot of different things. Uh, but to get things into perspective, you remember the, the, you remember the famous idiom in uh, philosophy, Western philosophy, God is dead. And it's always been attributed to Nietzsche. Well, yeah, we could say that that is true. But the thing is, really, it, it precedes the whole question of God's existence and identity, uh, which is no longer taken for granted, really is before Nietzsche. It's with Immanuel Kant. And, you know, he was contemplating the same sort of thing. Let's say more God is in trouble. Not so much God is dead. That might follow, you know, but God is certainly in trouble. And that was on his thinking when he made this Copernican revolution. Excuse me. And, uh, you know, yeah, just, just to get that into perspective, that the question of the identity, uh, the existence of God was actually prior to Nietzsche. In fact, one could say that these later people were mere commenters, really. They had intelligent things to say, uh, but it's mostly just a sort of a footnoting and commentary of something that had already happened maybe a hundred years before. Um, the, 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 you know, had to, the, and again, as I said earlier, it's Kant's thinking that really opens the modern age, not Nietzsche, not the you know the modernists. It's it's what we're talking about right now. Uh, so make no mistake about that. This is a very very important thinker. Nietzsche, as I said, Schopenhauer, these types are more mulling over with intelligent and interesting and witty things to say. But just, just in philosophy, it doesn't start with them. That, that's not quite true. But the thing we want to talk about is this. And that is in Kant's metaphysics, so to speak. And again, he's thinking very much of the structure of the brain now, right? Things have moved forward. We're not in the, metal, we're not in the medieval think. So what do we really know about biology and uh, psychology and all of that so with that in mind he he separated the worlds he said there's two realms to worry about here uh, that uh, previous philosophers hadn't really spoken about in this level of detail right a lot of his thought goes back to plato but he has a new twist on it there's the realm and again apologize for the, some of the phraseology there's the realm of uh the things we see every day and the things we experience. And that is the world of appearances. This is a word that turns up a lot in philosophy, appearance. So he says, there's a world all around us that we acknowledge, we recognize, we move through it, but it's really a world of appearances, right? And of course, that means to do with things like perception. We're not gonna get into all of that, right? But just the fact that you have five senses and, and those five senses register, not a real world, said Kant but a world that's largely appearances. And then there's another realm separate to that that he called the realm of things in themselves. In German, right? Things in themselves. There's a slight modification. We'll get to that in a minute. But just for now, this, but the thing, the thing to understand is that this, uh, this noumenal world, he invented the words phenomenal. The word we use every day, that's phenomenal. He invented and to counterpoint it, he had this word noumenal, N-O-U-M-E-N-A-L, noumenal. Now, this noumenal world of things in themselves is off limits to our intellect. But scientists would say, yeah, well, so what? A lot of things are unknown to us. That's why we're scientists. Reason and intellect will eventually you know, uncover it, just like all of our discoveries. But Kant said, no, no, you didn't listen to me. I didn't say unknown. I said unknowable. So of the two worlds, we have the world of appearances, which is where science's purview is. To, and science works great with that, you know, the world of appearances and uncovering that and, and, and investigating it and looking into it and inquiring and having the curiosity. But the noumenal world that is set off from this is completely screened off and is never going to be known. We can know nothing about it except maybe that it exists. That's the, that's the bottom line. You can know that it exists by intuition and by working it out logically. But we have to also at the same time realize that there are limits to reason, limits to intellect. And that is the limit. You're not going to be able to enter into the numeral or really understand anything about it. So it's not, this is the key thing to understand. It's not unknown. 
like things in our world may be unknown. It's unknowable. So this was like a remarkable, you know, and in many ways, you know, it is platonic because remember Plato talked about higher levels of the forms, right? Which is sort of the archetypal antecedents to, to our world. We have these shadowy forms. We have these shadowy appearances, same thing. But at least Plato grants that, hey, if God wanted it, the sage, the one who's cleansed themselves, can know a bit about the forms. He can, you know, the Socrates sort of sage can have access to that higher thought uh, of the noose, as, as, as Plato called it. Kant is saying, no, you can't. You're permanently locked into the world of appearances, and that's it. So there's a big difference, right? Uh, and so this sort of, you know, gave pause to people. Is there something really that's beyond the intellect that no amount of scientific progress ever, 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 ever? We're, we're going to be, pro, you know, screened off from this. And then the great statement that he made, that you know, is again one of these awesome statements that change philosophy is that since this is the case, and since I've delineated the limits of reason and the intellect, I am right to, and his say, he said, clip the wings of reason and make way for faith. So bear with us now, because this turns out to be a very, very important moment in the 18th century. I clip the wings of reason with reason, right? I, I rationally now understand that I am right to bring faith back to the table. No idea in the whole of history had such an impact, given the time, like I said, this race was on. And you had many people bashing science, but also bashing religion, you know, prior, and, and really, you know, firing some big holes into the wall, right? Along comes Kant, the master ambassador, and brings the scientist and the, and the theologian to the same table which had been, you know, no chance before. He's like a supreme historical, the ambassador of the worlds. Because he, when this statement was made, he was so eminent, you know, and his book was a bestseller, if you want to use that phrase. Everybody knew his theories at the time. Well, even scientists took notice, because remember, still to this day, 40% of the scientists are religious. They're believers. Well, it wasn't much different then. You had your atheists, but a lot of people in science were still believers. And they're the ones who looked up and went, oh, my goodness, why didn't we think of this? Right? So the, the, the phenomenal world and the nominal world, the noumenal and the phenomenal, you know, changed the way people looked at this, right? As I say, he, he, he did the unthinkable. He was a diplomat of philosophy that brought the, the scientist to the table. And even hardcore scientists had to logically accept this, by the way. So even those who were atheistic had to sort of take pause and went, Hey, we're right. You know, sorry, Kant was right, and these theologians are right. They've they've got a point. And so, really, what Immanuel Kant has done is salvaged Christianity. This thing would have been a tiny little Falun Gong cult today. And everybody needs to really understand this. They would have been some Moonies cult. Half a dozen people sit, you know, sitting on a haystack somewhere. That's what Christianity was becoming during the 18th century. And make no doubt about it. It was not robust. And in another hundred years, as we move close to the modern age, it would have been basically just like one or other one of these, you know, J the Jains in India or something like that. It would have shrunk down to almost zero, given the uh, juggernaut of science. But this man, one man, Immanuel Kant, saved the day apparently saved the day, stopped the Christian world from being, you know, and all the scholastic books, it would have been just sort of curios. The whole thing would have been in the intellectual dumpster, was actually going to be in the intellectual dumpster. I don't know if people have understood this. And all your priests who take seven-year degrees know exactly what I'm saying is correct. They know exactly what I'm talking about. They salute Immanuel Kant. On his, de his death day is, is worshipped by the ones in the know in the church. There's always they blow him a kiss for this because religion was back in favor. Think about Rome, think about how they, they actually breathe, you know, a sigh of relief, but not just them. Uh, religion was now back with a bang after being continually barraged and critiqued by every scientist, every scientific minded person, and now it was back with a bang. So, so, uh, you know, we have, this was an important moment. In, in life. And of course, on the other side, the religious people said, 
See, we were right all along. We have been committed to faith. Think of Martin Luther. Think of John Calvin. Think of Rome. Hey, this Emmanuel Kant, sure, he's only, all he's saying is that we were right in the beginning to tell you that faith is where it's at and that your silly scientific discoveries uh, don't really mean anything as much. The, the one who's closest to God is the one who has belief and faith. And now we have a philosopher of first rank who's proved it. Even Plato couldn't pull it off. And the Neoplatonists, men of such intellect, it's, it's hard to understand, hard to estimate. And then later, all the scholastics up to St. Augustine never quite did this because, remember, they were into metaphysics and religion, not epistemology. Kant had to do the Copernican Revolution to change the zeitgeist of thinking and philosophy and then found the answer. Of course, then nobody else before him you know, could have done because they were just strictly going by the rules of a manual that was slowly uh, uh, losing its traction, right? So now, of course, somebody could come along and say, well, no, see, the religious point of view always was, hey, you scientists, you can't falsify the existence of God. You're right to say we don't prove it. Because the moment you're into faith and belief, this does then become the predicament. So long before Kant's time and long after his time, right up to today, we have that problem. Science is not able to falsify the existence of God. Can't prove it, but also can't disprove it. So that's where the stalemate has. And most people today that you talk about will just, will just iterate that. They have no idea what we're talking about, about Immanuel Kant, something far, far deeper of another octave of proof. But... They will just go along with, yeah, science tries to disprove my God, but they don't, they can't really do it. And I, I have faith in God anyway. What's it got to do with them? Uh, and scientists also have to agree. Yeah, funny that we've been trying really hard, but we can't really falsify uh, the thing at all. Oh dear, I uh, wonder why that is. Let's keep plugging away at it. And that's where the stalemate where we mostly are in life. Um, and of course, somebody else would say, a more mystical type. Well, this is the kind of stalemate you get. If I can't falsify God's existence and I neither can prove it, I think there may be a couple of screws missing that we need. This is what you get when the real truth of a, of a matter isn't even brought to the table, you know. And I tend to be personally more like that myself. But now we can understand the title of Immanuel Kant's famous book, The Critique of Pure Reason. The Critique of Pure Reason. All it means is simply what we've just said. He's criticizing reason. And it's a critique because he wants to map out for you the limits of reason. So the book really should have been named The Limits of Reason. Because he's telling, he's talking to science and he's saying there are limits to your reason. And let me show you what they are. The realm of appearances and the realm of the thing in itself, the things in themselves uh, the real, the real essence of a thing that you don't have direct access to. You have access, your mind is only capable. This is something he said, that the intellect by the very dint of its makeup, how it sees the world, is inhibited to that degree. It cannot, no matter what, jump over that wall. If it did, it wouldn't be intellect. So I clipped the reasons of the intellect. I clipped the, re the, the wings of reason in order to make way for faith. As I said, break out you know the mush the, the marshmallows this was absolutely the, the christians were elated at this point and that's why we need to go into this and of course this also means then the limits of science doesn't it intellect and reason so oh my god the scientist was you know given a left hook sent them reeling uh, and they got up and went well you're right and this is this incredible moment which up until today it opened the modern age and everybody's had their say so about this thinking and, and whole schools of philosophy have come up, like I say, German idealism, in order to try and find weaknesses in this and, uh, and so on, right? So from that moment, the scientists have basically agreed. It's like this mafia handshake. You know, okay, Mr. Immanuel Kant, yeah, you're kind of a nice guy. After all, you've given us the phenomenal world to play about in okay, we got lots to do and we don't want to give up our compasses and protractors and all of it, you know, so, okay, so what you're basically telling us is our sandpit is just the phenomenal world of appearances. Get on with it. Discover, you know, how things work and how animal species come about and their behavior and their habits and the matter, the material of the world. Isn't that enough for you guys to get on with? And scientists went, 
yeah, we got to make better kinds of radio. We got to make better types of radiator and computer. Okay. And so basically, scientists have been puttering about, you get some exceptions, puttering about with the physical world, the phenomenal world. And they've been told to back off. It's a waste of time anyway, because of this, uh, you know, numinal world that is completely off limits. And basically, science has said, okay, we'll stick around and our uh, we'll, we'll preoccupy ourselves with the phenomenal world. There's plenty to learn, but the structure of water and building dams and whatever else science does, okay? And, and that's what they've been doing up until this time. Uh, now, it does peeve some people that you don't have access to that other world, but again, they're more speculative, speculative types. Uh, and, so, and, and then we, as, as laymen, all of the world, the very structure of our own consciousness means that we can only experience the realm of experiences and appearance. And if you want to believe in something higher, you can. But try faith on for size, right? You, you, you don't need to deal with anything more. So faith is back at the table then. This is, this is the crucial thing. Uh, now, in the next part, we want to look at how this whole Kantian edifice breaks down. And this brings us to a German philosopher, Johann Fichte, uh, 1762 to 1814. So he's alive when Kant is alive. And as I said, Kant's work was known all over the world. Everybody was not only reading it, but throwing the book across the room and arguing at the cafes. You know, it's amazing. This And this went right up until the 19th century, and, uh, you know, a little bit into the 20th, where People sat in the cafes of Europe talking about the philosophies. Things have changed, right? But this young man, Johann Fichte, who's a very eminent professor in his time, I think it was in Berlin, a university or wherever, don't quote me on that. It might have been Heidelberg, but I'm not sure. I think it was Berlin. Anyway, he saw the flaw in this whole thing. He's one of the world's most forgotten thinkers. Uh, and he devastated the world by coming up with, he's like the boy genius who spotted the flaw in everything we've just said. And he was ousted. He was dragged down from his chair at the university, thrown out of the town and completely ruined. So when you hear that story about the fate of great geniuses in the world, the story of, uh, of Johann Fichte is, is a case study in that because he lost everything this towering intellect uh you know was was completely ruined and destroyed just on the mere whim that he some of his writings looked slightly atheistic that's really about it oh and by the way he wasn't the only one and he was the teacher of hegel schelling holderlin and some of the greatest minds that german ever produced he was their teacher he was one of the idealists he started idealist idealism and there was other people in that school of idea that had also been banned from the city. I mean, completely rude. They just come and chuck you out on the merest idea that you said even one line, you know, whatever. And as a matter of fact, Kant himself, by the way, was warned by letter by the king and his agents, and then actually narrowly escaped being executed. Even he, he was too old. He was about 75 years old uh, when the letter came and he was, he was in the shit. The state thought that he was, had to be dealt with. And he actually kind of died, very similar to an earlier, much more earlier philosopher, Jacques Bohm. He died Well, the troops were basically coming down the street to get him and burn him at the stake. And Kant had, even he, had a, a similar fate waiting for him with these draconian, <clears throat> draconian uh, attitudes towards philosophers at that time. But Fichte and a couple of others had actually bore the brunt. Now, where Fichte uh, noticed a flaw, was, well, two things we'll deal with. They're so massive. One is that the noumenal world that's set away from us that we are unable to know anything about is described by Immanuel Kant as the cause of the phenomenal world. Just like Plato's forms give, they're like the molds, they're the original molds of anything we see here. Right? Okay, that was taken... Uh, that was taken as axiomatic, that the noumenal world is the creation 
of the uh, creates the phenomenal. The phenomenal comes out of the noumenal. And Kant had described all of this. But the problem that Fichte noticed, I'll try to put it simply, is that cause is something that you only can experience in the phenomenal world. It can't be part of the noumenal world. So to say that the noumenal causes the phenomenal makes no sense because cause, the very thing we know as cause and effect, causality, is a principle, a feature of our world. So wires have been crossed here. Because remember, it's also, you can put it this way. In the phenomenal world, we see many, many things. The world is just cluttered with stuff and people. And one thing causes another to be, right? A man can create a table. Uh, 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 the wind can uh, cause the trees to move and so on. Cause and effect is of our world. It's a reality we couldn't live without, as is time and space. If, two, if there's two things in our world, then they're divided by time and space. One may have been created before the other. In fact, I can only know two, three, four things because the coordinates I use to know a thing, like what's happening right now in Mexico City or whatever, right? It, 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 or a piece of news told me that something had happened yesterday. Time and space are the coordinates by which I navigate this world, the world of the phenomena. So time and space cannot also then be part of the noumenal world. Causality can't be part of the noumenal world. If they were part of the noumenal world, well, then they'd be, they'd be found in both worlds and the noumenal will collapse. Because it isn't different than our world and it isn't set apart. If time and space or causality have anything to do with the noumenal world, then the noumenal world doesn't exist. It cannot, it is knowable and it bears incredible similarity to our world. So everybody froze and went, uh, uh, right? So again, causation is a principle, right? Uh, a woman gets pregnant, she has a child. Cause and effect. I'm hungry, I go to get something to eat. Cause and effect. If I overeat, I get overweight. Cause and effect. If I don't eat, I'll die. Cause and effect. So causation and then time and space, which separates the many things. The manifold world is separated in space and it's separated in time. Uh, if I look at a star, that star may have already burned out, temporarily speaking. So suddenly, suddenly things change in the, in the Kantian worldview. The, the thing has, uh, you know, more rocky than people want would have thought. So now a lot of this has to do with the mind's capacities. Kant knew that, but he had not spotted this flaw in his own theories, right? So strictly said, Kant held that the noumenal realm, yeah, oh yeah, the second thing uh, is that rather than things in themselves, which is how it sort of came out to the world, Kant hadn't really said that. He had said there was thing in itself. Because remember, even Plato had multiple forms that are the molds from which earthly things get created. So it was more like people just reading it and not getting it quite right. It became sort of colloquial to say things in themselves multiple. But of course, that can't be either. So Kant's critics pointed out there can only be a thing, one thing in the noumenal world. To say things, again, makes it like the phenomenal world where we have things, you know, all of that. So it's really a thing in itself, one thing that could be God. But, but whatever that one thing is, it doesn't matter. The cause and effect cannot affect it. Because cause and effect are confined to this world, the world of appearances. So that had to be corrected. Not things in themselves multiple, that gives a wrong understanding. It's a thing in itself that we have no access to. Well, what is that? Is that God, uh, the power of God or whatever? But the more devastating critique was, was the one we've just mentioned. Now, what this does is it shows you that cause, or the noumenal world cannot be the cause of the phenomenal world. And therefore it's better said, there is no noumenal world at all. This is what it just logically leads to. That the whole premise of a noumenal world set off from the senses, set off from our world, different than the realm that we're in of appearances, 
collapses. It just, it's, it's, it's wrongheaded. But do you see from the way I presented it, what then happens is away goes Kant's proof of faith. If you dismantle the noumenal world as he presented it and, and the descriptions he has of it, then he, he, he came up with that phenomenal nominal dyad to bring in, right? Like I said, the diplomat to bring the scientists and the, and the theologians together and to give credence to having faith and belief. But if, like Victor did, you took away the premise and the raison d'etre of the, the noumenal world, then that collapses. And that means then that, uh, you know, you're back to square one. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're back to where it was before Kant even went through this whole mind experiment. Right. The noumenal world basically is a fiction. It collapses. And therefore, any kind of uh, substantiation of faith and belief is, is no longer there. You're back to where it was before Kant ever lived, right? So here's the weird thing, though. Why don't we know all of this? Well, because one, Fichte was removed from his power, probably just coincidence, of course. But the fact is that the world didn't take up what I've just said. They didn't take up Fichte's theory, his critique. They just moved ahead as if he hadn't spoken. So do you see the duplicity upon which now religion and Christianity is based? Everybody just turned over the page in Europe and just continued. Even Neo-Kantians, because you know, when Kant died, there was a school. I mean, like they may, some of them may have held to this, but it sure as hell didn't, you know. No, in fact, as far as I know, the Neo-Kantians continued believing, ignored Fichte and continued like everybody else did. Oh, he brought us to the table. We just poured the wine. We're just about shaking hands, science and religion. We've all agreed. Science has backed off and, you know, has attended to the phenomenal world and left us religious people alone to deal with the metaphysical. Why are we going to change that? Who's this young Fichte guy? How dare he stand up as Captain Kirk and go question? So guess what? The whole of Europe, all the th intelligentsia just didn't bother with the discovery and, and left Kant statue in pride of place. Can you believe it? So anyone out there who's ever thought, I think the whole world is just based in lies. I think these philosophers, scientists, and everybody, they're just, none of it has any validity meaning. You know, you're closer to the truth than you think. Here's one of the greatest collusions of idiocy that could ever have happened. And maybe Fichte's removal from his career and shown the city gates isn't, com isn't completely disconnected. He's one of the great forgotten teachers and thinkers. So glasses have been raised to this day on duplicity. When the religious folks raise their glasses to the memory of Kant, there's no validity in it. His noumenal world and his proofs for the validity of faith and belief are bankrupt. They don't exist. Now, the other idealists, Hegel and Schelling particularly, but others as well, they sort of continued with Fichte's beautiful insights right they in fact they they were in this class and so they continued poking holes in Kant his other we're not going to talk about that but he had so many things to say about other aspects of philosophy and if you know Hegel uh, he's probably the most misinterpreted of all philosophers of all time and that's saying that's being polite uh, and Schelling you know other other thinkers went on to continue to, to critique Immanuel Kant, okay? But we're, we don't have time to get into that. We just want to stick with this. So what this means, of course, is then that the case for Christianity is not as strong as it appears. And it doesn't have too much philosophical credibility. We're pretty much you know, reverting back to where we were before this time, back to the medieval. Now, there are many overwhelming consequences to this critique of Fichte. And I deal with those in my book, especially the one on Schelling. We've got two books on philosophy. Uh, and I deal with this kind of thing in there, the consequences of it, what it means uh, for those who are interested. Now, as I say, now that the Kantian thing had been thrown over, Hegel, as a young man, very important philosopher, he then said, right, 
So we are emboldened, even as religious people, to focus on the world that we see in front of us, which is no longer the world of appearances. See, when the, when the noumenal was destroyed, Kant's descriptions of this world that we're in being only a world of these ghostly appearances also falls apart. No, says Hegel, the world is by no means, God is too good to do that. The real spirit would never put us in just this ghostly world of appearances and shut the door. This was the critique he brought to bear. What kind of God would I want to worship? Who's, who's the real realm, the realm of perfection, the noumenal, why is it completely closed to everybody and completely unknowable? He was the one who rejected Kant right away just because of that. He said, God is good. The spirit is good. He would never play such a trick on us and leave us just awash in the world of appearances at the mercy of scientists and, and time unfolding like that. No, there must be another solution, a better proof of spirit, maybe even a better proof of why to have faith. But that's what he set his mind to do. So his philosophy is entirely based on what we're talking about. And he said about, as the others did, of finding better proofs for God, better proofs for spirit, better proofs for even faith, if you have to have it. Kant is not going to help you. And so German idealism got created. But the point I wanted to make was, first and foremost, said Hegel, then focus on the world that's in front of you, not as a world of appearances, but as a world of things as they really are. It's this world where we are given what we need to look at, know, and interact with. It's not a shadowy, ghostly, insubstantial place at all. It's exactly where our reason needs to be. That's why it is here. Don't be positing any other supernatural realms and all of that. We need to focus on this world. And then, you know, the Hegelian, the Hegelian philosophy did exactly that. Partly science, partly epistemology, partly metaphysics, but grounded in the world that is. It was a very important uh, moment in, in philosophy as well. <clears throat> the world of experience get out of your head that there's just these ghostly appearances take things as they are as the real the things are not appearances they are the real right in front of you and, and to think of anything else is, is really ludicrous uh, so this is the rejection of kant's ideas that gave rise to one of the most important uh, philosophical traditions german idealism which itself would be bashed by the positivists and the, you know, the materialists, you see, so every philosophical school and tradition is an answer to the past and then gets it's uh, critiqued by later thinkers later on. And, and when you're into philosophy, you've got to be able to look at all of that and weigh up whether any of these, you know, these critiques uh, have anything to do with reality. You know, are they really solid and, and robust or are they just fatuous and flippant? Right? This, is, this is how it works. Now, this has a lot of consequences for other thought, as I said, say even Carl Jung. Carl Jung's theories talk about an objective psyche. We're not going to go into it, but it's just the idea that in your unconscious mind, there's a realm set off from the conscious mind. Well, that has shades of Immanuel Kant in it. Think, uh, uh, think of quantum science. We're moving right up to today. Quantum science says, hey, our intellect's looking deeper and deeper into the material of the, of the universe and reality, but we meet a wall where it seems that we can't go beyond it. So there's shades that can't as well. But coming back to the psyche, Freud was the one who said, oh, the unconscious is just a large sort of underground grotto or attic or sort of dumpster that can be completely uh, you know, gutted We've got to get all of those repressions out. But his theory was that it was a fixed container, jam-packed full of all sorts of neurotic tendencies and syndromes, but you could unpack it completely, and that's health. Talk about it, come and lie on the couch, get all your repressions and angers or whatever it is, frustrations and hang-ups out, ah, and you'll be well. Carl Jung, of course, discovered what he called the, uh, the, the collective unconscious, which is a vaster realm. And his better word for it, collective unconscious is sort of descriptive and it's all right, but the real better description of it is called objective psyche, in which the contents of your deep unconscious are as objective to you, that means as foreign to you, as the world outside. And you have as little control. I have as little control over stopping the traffic and telling other people what to do and they'll do it as I have over my inner archetypes, the, the content of my deep unconscious. 
They don't answer to me. Well, there's a little shade of Kantianism in that. You see, this is, I'm just trying to demonstrate that later thinkers are hearkening back to the previous ones and picking those theories up again. And we certainly do have that in the quantum world. Uh, so, so he, but back to that point. Now that the, Fichte has spoken, you see, the, the scientist and the, and the religious person shouldn't be at the same table together. Scientists shouldn't be accepting the parameters of Christianity by saying, well, we're over here dealing with a phenomenal world, and you guys are perfectly right to be dealing in the realm of higher thought and you know, religion and, and metaphysics. No, that breaks down as well. That's all spurious. That, that party's over. And the same and vice versa. The Christian view of the scientist being their great enemy and all of this, you know, uh, again, doesn't really hold much water because we're not in the world of just appearances. The religion can't say, go away, little scientist. Go and study some lizards and bug-eyed, you know, things. Come back and tell us all about it. No, no, you have no right because this is not the realm of appearances. This is the world of the real, the very concrete. So again, you know, science is sort of winning the day. And believe you me, some of these hardcore scientists, they really, really believe that. Uh, you know, that faith is certainly not needed. And don't you bring it to me. I have no interest in faith. We must put our, you know, faith in science and science only, even despite its mistakes and errors and wrong turnings. So hundreds of years gone by, but we're, we haven't really made a lot of progress. Huh? Uh, and the person then, one would say that the person who insists on belief really hasn't got it together. You know, they're sort of existentially uprooted. They don't have much credibility to, 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 to validating that. Or they can't validate it. You know, once upon a time, Immanuel Kant gave them something to hold on to that could validate it. Uh, but actually, that turned out to be jelly in their hands, you see. Which means that the person of faith and belief is really evading reality. The scientist, at least for all his errors and lunacy, is still at least honoring the reality that's in front of him. And that's why they're more robust. And that's why they'll win a lot of arguments. And that's why they are very arrogant, you know, with a lot of hubris. We're trying to unpack a lot of the reasons why. And you need to know this when you go into communication with them. These are such important uh, things to know about. It's not unimportant. And on a deeper level, like Hegel was saying, if there is a thing called the soul and there is a thing called spirit, then when are we going to bother finding some legitimate proof to it? Maybe we need to co opt science. And that's what your Rupert Sheldrakes and your Bruce Liptons, right? And uh, your Dov David Bohms have done. And they've made incredible progress. But Hegel was the first in line to say, I believe in those things, but we have to find much more consistent evidence for it, working with science, working with the world, not negating it in a Gnostic way and saying, oh, it's such a little dirty and a realm of ghostly appearances. We have to base our belief and faith not on something transcendent and for all the wrong bloody reasons. You know, uh, 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 and of course, but then think for a moment, at the time of Kant, or even before, think of a Luther, think of a Calvin. Think of the man today who has put his entire investment into faith and belief. What is their psychology? What do they feel about themselves in the world? Aren't they completely imbued with certainty? Because we're stepping sideways, look at the psychology. Luther, Calvin, Anyone today of the mega churches, anyone who's put their investment into faith and belief as opposed to study and intellect and reason has a conviction so deep. And we're just showing here that's based in nothing. But look at their own feeling of conviction. Their whole lives are based in it. And there's a feeling of very robust conviction that there's no more mysteries. I've got it all. My belief in God is all I need. So I'm not really not interested in psychology and science or even progress. I know within my heart what I know, right? Well, actually, you know, it's belief and faith. And that's good enough for me. So isn't there a kind of a strange self-referencing, uh, you know, a delusion in all of that? Psychologically? 
because it's not really that based on anything that robust, but it is to the personal and the psychological level. They've got the security. So when I said uprooted existentially, yeah, but that person then has to compensate. They can't go through the world uh, you know, with that level of insecurity and anxiety. So the faith and belief are psychological. They're coming from a state of deep unrest and anxiety that needs to be compensated for. They're, not, they're, they're just like a mountain climber who's in fear of falling. He's got these hooks and he's got these ropes and he'll just cling on to those for dear life. But they will not give up the elation. There's a psychological feeling of elation that you're bigger than the world. You've got the answer. And this is where these people live. And they're doing untold evil in the world. They're not just some little cult over here and over there. The, the person of faith and belief, by living in a state of inner delusion, do wreak havoc in the world. You know, if, uh, their worldview is not holistic or clear. That's by no means, you know, to augment the average atheistic science, scientist. That's not what we're talking about. But you can't go around with a mentality equivalent to a lunatic in an asylum in the psych ward and call that religious. You can't go around as an inflated psyche and call that spiritual. You, it's more like a kind of possession. Faith and belief are possessions. You've been possessed by them. Like a kind of disease almost. And look how many people are infected. And look how many people in the name of religion. And the name of is what I'm talking about. Look what they've done. You grew up in Belfast. You know, original sin, sure. It's all original sin. You were born a sinner. This is very, very real. You know, witches have been burned. But certain failures of science... They say, oh, well, it's not as perfect as it is, you know, so I'm right to have faith and belief. But it's a psychological phenomenon. Right? And unfortunately, it's still something that hasn't gone away. Uh, as I said, some people might point to a certain amount of proof of Kant by looking at the quantum world. But no, no, the, the wall in the quantum is the wall between us and the secrets of nature, not God. If there's something stopping us penetrating into the material of this world and its origins, well, that's a natural problem. And again, might have a lot to do just with the construct of our minds, the categories by you know, time and space. That's very much important in quantum science, isn't it? Causality is the big problem. As David Hume had already predicted years ago, yeah, you're going to have a problem with that, and they are. They're having a terrible problem with that. But that's more in this world of nature. It, it's not a religious issue to that degree. Some people try to make it. Uh, and if reason is in some way blocked, it still doesn't mean that not, uh, what is faith and belief going to do for me in the quantum world? I mean, it's, it doesn't fit, even though it does have shades, shades of that, right? And it would be interesting if Kant was alive, what he might say about that, you know, because he would, he would say, oh, there's your limits of reason. But again, be very, very careful with that because it's not quite the same. You're, pro you're probing into the nature of nature. It remains non-metaphysical. And there's no guarantee that tomorrow, you know, we do find the answer to penetrate that wall. It's not the wall. You cannot say that the quantum has proven Kant or oh, the noumenal is back. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Kant, uh, Fichte's criticism stand forever, even in terms of the quantum universe. It can't be the cause. Some other realm outside this cannot be the cause of this world. If you follow the logic through that we've been, we've been uh, describing here, right? And of course, all that, when you come up against these cognitive blocks, especially now with neuroscience, they, they're completely bankrupt. They've, they've reached the wall in, in terms of understanding the origins of the nervous system and, uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, but that is because maybe our view from the start, the you know, pre principles, precepts, Ayn Rand always said, go back to your fundamental premises when they lead wrongly, Go back to the fundamental premises. So that, that could be one of the answers there. And religious people certainly need to do that. This is what, what Hegel was talking about, begging them to do. So uh, I, was, I was just going to say that uh, if you plug in Nietzsche here, 
he would say, oh, yes, you can't penetrate into the quantum universe any more than you can penetrate into heaven and falsify that because you're not meant to. You as man will always be brought back to yourself. There are no way out. There's no ways out. There's no easy routes away from the reality of who you are, good and bad. Life is designed, the universe is designed to not let you continually escape, either if you try through drugs or religion or even science. All of those things are trying to find, you know, they're trying to pick their way out. Like, you know, and yet the real reality, the real philosophy is to return you continually to yourself, to face yourself, the good and the bad. That's what all religion is. That's what all philosophy is. But uh, he would have just looked at this quantum puzzle in that way and say that, no, no, you're not going to find ways out of escaping you know, and evading the beings you are. So real philosophy is existential to that degree. It returns you to who you are in and of yourself as an individual, uh, looking into your own being. You know, and of course, this is where the Freuds and Jungs come in and so on. But I hope we'll, we'll finish it there. But I, I just hope that people realize then <clears throat> that there's nothing too lauding in people who are, you know, clinging uh, pathologically to faith and belief. You know, we just, we've just discovered that that wasn't working before Kant's time. And it uh, appeared to get some more traction. It was a, like a shot in the arm. Some more adrenaline from this incredible Immanuel Kant. And again, he had a lot of things to say about other things. But those two critiques of Fichte, that there can only be one thing in itself, and that doesn't help us. And more importantly, the noumenal world cannot be the cause. Of the, of, the, of the world we're in because cause is something of this world and only of this world as our time and space. Michael Tsarian, thank you.